are going to, oh, hang on. Okay, so we're going to start a new um, sort of format for the calls. Um, we're gonna be doing speakers one week and then the book club the next week because it's just too much to, to put in both weeks. And then some of the stuff we've put in place is um, some of the new changes is we do have an agenda. So we've actually parsed out the time. Um, we'll do announcements in the beginning, talking about what happened in the last meeting um, and what have you, any changes, any marches people are going to, what have you. Um, during the call, when we have a speaker, everybody needs to be muted so that they can speak for their length of time, which is about 30, 30 35 minutes or so. And then um, we'll do like a 10 minute question period. So you should all be able to hover over if you're on a computer, I don't know what laptop or on uh, phones, but you can put your hand up. Um, and the thing is, uh, where did Kimberly go? Oh, there you are. Kimberly, can you show everybody how you put your hand up on the screen, how you put that little, do you remember how to do that? <laughs> I don't have the that. hands up on my, Thing. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, put thumbs up. Yeah. so up. Where is that? if you have a question, you can put that up and then, um, you know, uh, just everybody sort of has to go in turn because a lot of times I think people are super passionate about the speakers and they just want to get their questions out and so they talk over each other a little bit. Um, you can also put your questions in chat as well and then Kimberly or whomever can actually, um, you know, say that. <laughs> well. So, we're gonna do that and then at the end, we'll do another announcement. Um, we just wanna make sure that we have everyone's email addresses as well. So if you don't have it, put that in the chat so they can grab it. The um, notes from the call and a recording of the entire video will go in an email to everybody. And then if you like what you see and everything was good, um, you can send that on to friends or family to have them join. Um, if you weren't able to make the call, it'll still go to you via email every week so that you're able to see what happened during the days that you might have missed. And that was really it. So, and then the next thing would be when we have speakers, um, whoever invited the speaker is going to do an introduction, talk about you know their background, books, what have you. And those links will also be sent out in the email as well on Fridays. So we're just trying to make it a little bit more um, I mean, professional, a little bit smoother so that people have a chance to talk, ask questions, and then everybody gets heard. And that's it. So um, I am <coughs> super sick. So I actually just jumped on to do this really fast and then I'm gonna go lay down in bed. Um, so I'm looking forward to the recording so I can actually hear everybody speak. <coughs> Sorry, both my child and I are sick. So I'm gonna go lay down. Um, and, uh, but I'll be, I'm always on Twitter. If you guys need anything from me, let me know. Otherwise I'll see you next week when we talk about the book. Right. Nice meeting you. It was really nice to meet you as well. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not able to be on, but that's okay. This is uh, the first of many. I'm sure. So <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Oh. All right, everybody. Love well. you. Thank you. Sassy. And I'll, uh, I'll care, see you huh? on Twitter. All right. Bye. You are epic. Okay. Uh, I'm Dawn, and I'm going to say I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do tonight, like Sassy said, is we're asking everybody to stay muted. Paul, Virginia, and Daniel are going to be unmuted. If you have questions for them, put them in the chat. They can answer. You guys can answer whenever you feel like it. You know, just take the conversation where you want, want it to go. We want to hear from you. Uh, Paul wrote Sandra's hands. I've got it. <laughs> On my cell phone, I was going to hold up a picture of it. This is Paul at Wounded Me. He took a job as a teacher at the BIA in the early 70s. And uh, he and his wife, Virginia, lived in the BIA compound, and he's one of those rare teachers that tried hard to engage with every child, figure out what angle they were coming from, and try to teach them how to be a human being. And this was in a time where the mindset was still, kill the man, kill the Indian, save the man. Uh, he left a paid job at the BAI to take an unpaid job at the mission because he cared about the kids. 
and his wife, Virginia, backed him every step of the way. She was a volunteer at the library. I mean, they did incredible things for those kids. And it was during the reign of terror. Uh, they had to walk a very fine line between the FBI and the Lakota trying to protect the Lakota. And instead of just trying to teach them, they ended up trying to save their lives. And that's what Sandra's hand arose out of. I am deeply impressed with you as a teacher, with you both as people, and with your partnership. I mean, you guys have struggled alongside each other. That that was real clear throughout the book. And that's rare. Uh, I will mute myself and you guys can take it from here. Oh, well, okay. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I think the thing we should talk about is uh, what is happening right now and how we got involved with writing this letter to President Biden. Uh, if you're going to be reading Sandra's hands, I don't want to go over all the, <laughs> the story, but to mention a few things that uh, I was hired as a Bureau of Indian Affairs, seventh and eighth grade teacher in 1971. And uh, it was, uh, we lived through the siege and through the, uh, the, the reign of terror. Um, probably the most bizarre thing was that um, I had not been on the reservation more than three months when I was, beat, I was beaten by the tribal police, broke my jaw. <laughs> I was in charge of students at the time. It was in front of my students. And it was about the worst situation you could think of. Uh, but uh, ironically, it turned out to be a very good thing because from that point on, I was pretty acceptable to the traditional people and to the American Indian movement. <laughs> oh, he's okay. Your badge of honor, right, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea at the time, but I stood up to it. And I mean, I, I dealt with it and, uh, and it was respected. So, but uh, at, at any rate, um, second or third day of the siege, a tribal employee and myself came upon two FBI agents brutalizing a family. We intervened right away, reported it. The agents were sent off the reservation. They were gotten rid of. And the number two agent in charge of the siege said, I want you reassigned from being a school teacher to the tactical teams. And you will have authority to intervene. Uh, any situation that's going out of control. Now, bear in mind, I'm a seventh and eighth grade teacher, but uh, unlike the FBI agents, I had military experience, two deployments to Vietnam, which they did not have. Mine were with a Naval Air Group, but I had military training and so on and so forth. So um, <clears throat> I did that and indeed did intervene in two situations, stop the gunfire, stop things from going out of control, which was at times, it was somewhat dangerous, but also kind of amusing at times um, because uh, I, I had checked with American Indian Movement with uh, Russell Means in Pine, in Wounded Knee and had the permission of American Indian Movement to be on the federal side. And they said, you know, don't point your gun at anybody, don't shoot, ever fire your gun, but keep those animals from killing people. And we have no problem with you being on that side. So, and in one situation where we just had to stop the gunfire, we had an FBI agent who was screaming in panic. Ah! <laughs> so, Joe and I just stood up and said, hey, everybody, stop shooting. And it was immediately when the people are wounded knee. So it's Paul and Joe. Oh, hi. <laughs> and there's another FBI agent, marshals, oh, we're looking at this thing. You two are either the stupidest or the smartest, and I can't figure out what. But, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, seeing an FBI agent panic under fire 
was one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. I will never respect the FBI after that. I will never be intimidated by them in the slightest because what we had to do to pull him out and get him out and his partner, they were just panicking. Um, I'd never seen such a level of cowardice. Anyway, um, we, um, the thing that has left a very big impression on us is what happened after the siege. Now, one or two of you may, uh, I don't know you, you may have lived through this and experienced even more than we did. But what infuriated the, the FBI was so many people who were in Wounded Knee were charged with crimes in state and federal courts. And what was happening is the juries weren't convicting them. They were actually pretty decent. Uh, they um, was a, you know, they had some issues down there. We don't see this as a, a convictable crime. So the juries were letting them go, which just infuriated the, uh, the FBI because they felt this was a national humiliation and what had taken place at the BIA building in Washington, DC. And for reasons unknown, they let Dick Wilson and the goon squad run pretty wild on the reservation. And those of you who lived through it, you know there were drive-by shootings, there were beatings, were very common. There were murders, there were killings. Sandra Woundedfoot, my student, was murdered, raped um, by Paul Herman, who was a BIA special investigator. Um, we had another student shot, she survived. But um, it was a time that was indeed a reign of terror and people were, um, especially traditional people, we're gathering in compounds for safety. And uh, I, it's not a pleasant time to remember at all because there was so much violence that we encountered. I quit, we both, well, I quit the Bureau and we both stayed in Porcupine, a village six miles north of Wounded Knee, but we became part of a mission school there, mission volunteers, because I just in good conscience could not stay with the Bureau of Indian Affairs anymore. It was such a corrupt organization. Um, but, um, and at that time after Delphine Redshirt was shot, we wrote to the president and said, you have to get Indian police here to protect the children. And President Ford, the letter got right through to him and he acted, which leads me to believe Biden might act from the communications he's getting today about Leonard. Uh, as we all know, Leonard was never convicted on the basis of any facts, any solid evidence. And the Ridley letter, Reynolds letter, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, exposes that openly. So now the FBI at this point will attempt to intimidate even a president. They did it to several other presidents. Um, they will violate the law. They will uh, use extra legal procedures and they will use third parties to intimidate. Uh, uh, Attorney Crooks wrote a letter on uh, there's an attorney that wrote a letter to NPPR, the no parole, and Ed Woods has it in his website, uh, saying the exact opposite of what Reynolds was saying. So they're trying to uh, <clears throat> refute Reynolds, but they don't have the facts or the knowledge base. Um, let's see, Dawn asked me a unusual thing. Why is Ed Woods in the uh, uh, sure. <laughs> hands. Actually, I give him a thank in Sandra's hands. Well, it, it, surprisingly enough, we've communicated so much over the 20 years. We kind of become, I won't say friends, but enemies. Okay. 
and when I was writing Sandra's hands, I said, Ed, would you mind being a beta reader? Could you check it for factual uh, accuracy and just give me criticism? He said, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. that. And actually, <clears throat> he did find a couple of minor factual errors, which were very helpful. He also set up a couple of he introduced me to several other people in the FBI, and I was able to interview them to get additional information. So he was very helpful. And of course, he made some su suggestions which were just delusional and off the wall. Oh, and, my God. Ignored yeah, them. But I thought, uh, so, you know, I'll thank him. And, uh, uh, I just I just want to say publicly, excuse me, Paul, had yeah. it not been for Paul, um, I, Kimberly knows this because she and I have had private message exchanges, but Ed Woods at one time in his efforts had alleged that the reign of terror was a myth. And Paul actually was the one who really uh, put him in his, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say put him in his place, but let's just say checked him because he was asserting that it was uh that it was um, a myth that had been trumped up by the Peltier supporters. And then when Paul and Virgie came forward and Paul was, I think you, you were right in Sanders' hands at the time, long time ago. Um, and uh, uh, Paul was able to, you know, Paul was able to dispel that uh, thinking <laughs> that Ed Woods used to have. <laughs> so I just wanted, I don't know if, the, I don't know if everyone on the call knows that, but at one time Ed Woods had actually, uh, had actually, um, it's almost like, um, it's almost, I think the bond is like, um, uh, one of the things I do outside of, uh, you know, my work with Paul and for Leonard is um, I'm a Thai boxer. And uh, you really develop these, you know, you really develop these bonds with people, even, you know, even though like when you do sparring and you're trying to hit each other, you know, there's a bond, you know, there's a bond that comes from that war, that conflict. So I think it's kind of similar to the bond that they kind of shared because they're both embroiled in this conflict. Paul's here, Edwards is there, um, but Paul. Uh, but thanks to Paul, Paul was able to, you know, Paul was able to show Edwards the truth, um, which comes out beautifully in the book. Well, thank you. The, by the way, the letter that we wrote uh, is uh, he he called me and he said, "Can we put this?" on the website, you were there. And he said, we've checked you out, you're accurate. He was very respectful. And it's still on the No Parole Peltier uh, website um, to this day. And the, the letter was written over 20 years ago. But I pointed out that uh, President Ford didn't think the reign of terror was a uh, delusion. Um, and it's a matter of record, the, uh, the federal government intervened by sending 12 Indian police from around the country to with one role to protect the children, which they did very, very well, by the way. They were incorruptible and uh, dedicated to what they were doing. So my hope with all, all of you is that this bleeding wound, which for us, involves Sandra also can partly be healed by Leonard's freedom. It won't undo what has been done, but uh, some of the bleeding will stop for many of us. And uh, we're, we're very, very hopeful. Well, it's like 20 minutes. So I think <laughs> there's so much we could say, but probably best to uh, answer questions um, if you have any. I have a question. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming again. Um, we, I really appreciate it. Okay, I had put it in chat. It seems like a very strange question, but I was looking through um, Sandra's hands. I haven't read it yet because um, I just received it actually. I had the audible, but I had to order the, you know, the hand, I like the, the book. <laughs> so um, thank you for that though, for the audible. But um, I was reading, just kind of glancing through it and talked about um, an increase in influx of UFO sightings during the reign of chair. Yes. <laughs> I was like, like, really? <laughs> oh, yes. 
Can you tell was, me a little bit about that? I was interested in that. Oh, oh it was it was very pronounced. Um, the local priest, Father Charles, saw um, the cook, Tommy's mom, yeah. at the mission. Something was hovering over her cabin, scared her, uh, hovered for 45 minutes or so in the morning, and it really, really scared her. And it was metallic if she could see it. Um, and it was uh, paranormal experience where we were under observation of some kind. The, um, and I was the science teacher at the mission school. And I started interviewing some of these people, collecting, um, you know, on cassette tapes. And finally, the county um, hydraulics engineer, because there's a county system also. There's a reservation in the county. And I forget the name of the county. But the man, can, can I come and talk to you? I've seen something. Can I come talk to you? And he's out at night going to these dam sites, little dams, stock dams. And he'll be at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he says, and the, this man was um, Native American, has a master's degree in this field, highly educated, highly articulate. And he was shaken to the core. He came and he said, I saw this metallic object about 18 feet across. He said, I walked up to it. I can't remember if he actually touched it or not, but it didn't fit in his worldview. And he was shaken by this. Uh, and he said, I have to just have to tell someone. I have to talk about it. I have to. And this was, um, I can't remember his name either. But it got to the point, there were so many sightings that uh, I called the local Air Force base and I said, we are, people are coming to me and talking about what they're seeing. Could you send somebody down here and we'll set up a community meeting. And could you just explain to us what's happening? And they just laughed. Oh, we don't believe in such things. There are not such things. And I said, well, you may not, what is it you don't believe? You don't believe that people are coming and seeing something or you don't believe they exist because the phenomena of people reporting the experience does exist. Then what happened was two other things that happened. A minister on the reservation, I was talking to him and he said, things have gotten so evil here, he said, that normally the devil hides behind a facade and you can't see him, but he's come right out into the open here, which I could understand because also had angelic presences, things that positive things. I mean, it happened with us. You <coughs> get there to the mission. It happened to us, you know. Um, also, at one point, I got this horrendous feeling I should not be interviewing people anymore. I mean, it was like, don't touch this, get away from it. I destroyed all the tapes and everything, and I didn't, it no longer became a scientific investigation for me. The feeling was just overwhelming. And I figured that's a message. I got to back away from it. Because some of this, some of this was undoubtedly good, but some of it was bad. I don't have a complete explanation for it, but it was a phenomena that was taking place along with an incredible amount of evil and also at the same time, heroic goodness. There were extremes, they were very extreme. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Can I ask you to talk about a couple of things? Yes. You wrote in your book about how forcing a white curriculum upon native students uh, eliminates their survival skills. And that is still pretty much going on. I would, it's kind of silly, but I would also like to hear about the crazy mules. <laughs> <laughs> he and Haw? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll talk about the crazy mules first. Believe me. <laughs> uh, they, they were at the mission school actually uh, 
they were a chuck wagon, a pair of mules, and they were crazy. They were as moody as could be. They had blinders. And the only thing in their state of consciousness was their next three steps. But they were totally, totally cognizant and very adept at that. <laughs> but I swear, going downhill at full speed between he, he and Hall with metal rims and no, no. <laughs> Breaks. Well, it was a break, but no uh, cushion of any kind was the greatest speed I've ever experienced. And I've landed on a plane on an aircraft carrier before, but that was nothing compared to this. Um, they were <laughs> bizarre animals. Bizarre. And the going home. And what was the other thing? Oh, oh curriculum. Yes, it was Scott Forsman back then. Um, but the uh, it was cultural genocide. It was uh, culturally programming cultural genocide. And I don't know what they're doing today, but the Catholic mission school was way on the other spectrum of having a Lakota program, Lakota culture program, Lakota teachers. Uh, and But the Bureau of Indian Affairs was, uh, it was preparing kids to live in Poughkeepsie, New York, or Denver, Colorado. There was there was no identity. It was removing identity. And when obviously I I was very aware from within weeks of being on the reservation, the removing identity is a form of cultural genocide. Uh, particularly uh, in Alaska, in the villages in Alaska, it's ongoing today. The same thing uh, with disastrous results. The uh, every culture has a right to perpetuate itself through education, and when the dominant culture takes that away, it's a form of genocide. In my mind, in our opinion. Very well said, Daniel. What do you have to say, my friend? Oh well, I mean, Paul's such a great speaker. <laughs> um, well. It's just an honor to be here, and uh, it's, it's an honor to be a part of that project with Paul. Um, I met Paul a long time ago um, in the course of doing lead research work for a film on Leonard Peltier, um, and that's how we met, and he had finished Sandra's Hands, and uh, we had interviewed Paul, and we had stayed in touch with him. Um, but uh, Paul was having, uh, having a little bit of trouble finding a publisher, so I always believed in the book and I always believed in the story of Sandra's hands. <clears throat> and of course he gave us a picture of Sandra. And uh, to this day, uh, until we had to start working from home, I've had Sandra's picture on my desk ever since I met Paul. Uh, her, she, her picture has always been on my desk at work. Um, so anyway, um, so we got the book published. At, uh, first, we had a great editor named Frank Anderson who came in and edited for, uh, the book for us, did a great job, and uh, uh, really helped Paul's voice shine even better and stronger. And then we, uh, Audible Studios was interested in the audiobook production. And um, the funny thing was, um, you know, when we were arranging the first publication, we were looking for someone to write the forward and I was trying to like line somebody up. And then Paul actually out of nowhere just emailed and said, you know, I think we're overlooking one of the most qualified people in the world to do this. <laughs> Three letters, capital Y O U. So I said, Oh, <laughs> I said, Oh, uh, you know, okay. Well, that, that'd be an honor, Paul. I would love to, to do that. So um, I wrote the, I wrote the forward for it and uh, Sandra's hands was released I believe in 2016, right, Paul? The book, the the first, the the the, the paperback and the ebook in, in the ebook were released on in 2016, and then in 2019, production wrapped on the audio book, which is narrated by Victor Bavine, and uh, I voiced my own forward. So if you ever listen to the Audible audiobook version, you will hear me voicing my own forward, which is kind of cool because you know I've worked for Audible 14 years now, going on 14 years. I work for Audible Studios, which is the audiobook publisher. It's the largest audiobook publisher for download in the world. And uh, having Sandra's hands come through um, and being a part of that um, 
was was really an honor. And uh, the funny thing is, um, not the funny thing, but um, one moment that I won't forget, I should say, it's a better way of phrasing that, uh, was the day that I was tapped to go into the studio and record it. And uh, as I said before, I've had Sandra's picture up on my um, up on my uh, at my desk, and uh, I had every intention of bringing that um, picture into the booth with me when I read the forward. And um, when I was on my way, uh, the acquiring editor who signed Sandra's Hands, Audible Studios, uh, I bumped into him and I said, oh, his name is Ryan. I said, Ryan, I'm on my way to the studio, you know, to, to, to record the forward. And he yelled out, well, don't forget to bring that picture of Sandra. And I said, oh, I, I'm one step ahead of you. I already brought it. And uh, when I went into the studio to record it, um, uh, you know, it, I was probably in there for about maybe a half an hour or so, but I really felt the most strong spirit overcome me. Like there was finally some resolution. No, I wouldn't say maybe resolution is the wrong word, but there was finally some peace that was coming from this. And I emailed Paul right away. And I said, it's a wrap, Paul. Production has now wrapped. And I just got out of the studio. I brought Sandra's, I had somebody take a picture of me. And I said, really, Paul, like I played the AIM song. I said, I really feel like she was with me. And Paul wrote back, oh, Paul, he said, oh, Dan. He said, I really have, I really have had the strongest feeling that she is fully aware of what's going on. And, you know, it's really an unfortunate circumstance where uh, over the years, the devastation that has been done to the Indian community has reduced in a lot of ways, Indian names to just names and statistics, you know? Um, and I didn't want that for Sandra Wounded Foot because this was a special girl. She had a special story and Paul had a special story and I wanted that story to be shared. So she's not gonna be just another name. Now she's immortalized forever. Um, but going back to what Paul said, uh, and I, you know, if you don't mind me continuing for a little bit, but to echo um, the reign of terror of what happened, um, I recently was able to uh, obtain copies of the Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization's documents. This was the committee that was formed um, as a result of Dick Wilson's atrocities on Pine Ridge. Um, I sent copies to Paul. Um, and it is there. It is the only primary documents that we have related to what was really happening on, on Pine Ridge. And um, there was almost a sort of dictatorial rule going on with Dick Wilson. Uh, he presided over the reservation with an iron fist. And if you dared go against him, if you were lucky, you were just excommunicated from any kind of funding or aid that the tribal government could provide you. If you were lucky, that's all that happened. Um, you know, which obviously is immoral and it's, uh, you know, it's probably illegal. Um, but even all that aside, the stories that you hear uh, still impact the Pine Ridge to this day. You know, uh, Paul, some, you know, he, he Paul, Paul will tell you, you know, it, it's, it's an emotional experience. Virgie, I'm sure would agree. I don't want to speak for them, but I will say that in the course of the research I've done over the years, there have been some people that don't even want to talk about it because it was so traumatic um, and there's never been any justice for it. Um, so some of the work that Paul and I are trying to do um, is really um, almost the justice to try to help foster that justice along so that the story can be told and can be preserved, you know, because the fact of the matter is people really never investigated these crimes and they let these uh, atrocities happen. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be unsettled until there's some form of justice. Uh, so, you know, to work alongside somebody like Paul's one of my favorite people. Um, let me tell you a quick story about Paul. Paul was now Paul, please interject if part of the story is incorrect, but Paul was one, Paul was Leonard's chief witness during one of his parole hearings uh, in the 1990s. Uh, he, given his, given his experience, uh, he knows Leonard, by the way, uh, longer than, you know, longer than a lot of us do. Um, and, uh, uh, at in in the nineties, when he was the parole, when he was one of the uh, when it was when he was the chief witness, uh, that was also at a time. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure if it was the same parole hearing, but I think it was. Um, Ramsey Clark was Leonard's lawyer, and Ramsey yes. Clark told told me the story. That oh, this is this is yeah. one then. Okay. Oh, okay, great, great. Um, I was happy to tell Paul the story because Paul. 
Paul has such a, and, Paul, and Virgie too, they both have such big hearts. When you get to know them, they have like the biggest hearts. And to this day, Paul has felt that he he's never done enough for Leonard, which I always tell him that's not true. And because he, he has always done a lot for Leonard. And this, this is, I'll, I'd like to share this story because this is going to come out eventually in a book that Leonard and I are working on. Um, so Leonard, he was Leonard's chief witness in the 1990s for his parole hearing. And Ramsey Clark, the renowned um, civil rights attorney and former deputy attorney general and attorney general for the United States was Leonard's lawyer. Leonard went and did the parole hearing. Paul was the witness. Uh, they deliberated. They made Leonard wait the three to four weeks that they maximum time waiting period that they can wait. And they denied him parole. Um, as usual, um, it's unfortunate, but that was happening quite regularly at that point since he'd been incarcerated. He'd been incarcerated. But then um, several months after the fact, Ramsey Clark was telling me that he had gone to a federal prison, uh, you know, several months after the fact, completely unrelated to Leonard's case. And uh, one of the prison guards said, oh, Mr. Clark, it's nice to see you again. You know, shook his hand and Ramsey Clark didn't recognize him. So he said, oh, do I know you? And the guard said, oh, yeah, you don't remember me? And he said, no, I, I, I don't remember you. And he said, well, I was, the, I, I was at Leonard Peltier's parole hearing. I was, the, I, was the, I was the hearing officer that presided over the hearing. And he said, really? What are you doing here? And he said, well, I don't know if you know this, but I initially recommended that Leonard be paroled based on the new evidence and the testimony that was presented during the parole hearing. Um, they decided to go against my recommendation. They overruled it. They voted against Leonard's parole. And now I'm a prison guard. He was demoted for recommending Leonard be paroled. So um, that is the closest that I know of, um, aside from obviously at the, towards the end of President Clinton's term as president, um, you know, from, from all accounts, I'm led to believe that we were very close then, but we might've been even closer with Paul's uh, uh, testimony during the parole hearing. That was the, the, the actual hearing examiner recommended that Leonard be paroled after that. So um, that is, th those two moments are probably the closest that Leonard has gotten to being free, uh, thanks to Paul, the first one. So how do we get out from underneath that? The fact that the DOJ basically runs the country. We've lost our democracy. We were living under the totalitarian rule of the DOJ. Mm. Well, uh, you need letters like uh, Paul's to Joe Biden. You need to put pressure on them because when the people speak, there's an old saying, the voice of the people is the voice of God. When the people speak and the people unite, um, that's really when change can come about. Um, so like when you have groups like this group who are of like mind and who all want the best for society. And in this case, for Leonard, um, you know, that's how that's how the movement grows. And that's how the movement gets attention, um, you know, because it does just because the powers that be um, are trying to keep Leonard in prison doesn't mean that we have to stand for it. So um, it really is the, there's not there's a lot to that saying that there's strength in numbers. Um, so there certainly is, you know, and the more statements can be made like Paul's, um, the, you know, the more impact they can have, um, you know, because, for example, for the first time in I don't know how long, uh, when Leonard had COVID, um, there was a question directed at the White House press secretary during a White House press briefing. I don't even know if that's ever happened before with Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier's name got brought up in the White House. You know, that was amazing. I mean, we put the pressure on, um, you know. Worked with Kevin Sharp, who's the lead attorney, um, uh, you know, in trying to secure, you know, any medical records that we needed to provide, you know, to see if we could get Leonard released under the CARES Act. Um, but that, you know, things like that, you know, that uh, this year has been a very good year for Leonard as far as publicity goes. His name has been in the paper and on the rate. It is impossible that Joe Biden has not heard Leonard's name by now. <laughs> by now. He has to have at this point. You know, so I write him a letter every day. Oh, good. And I tell him he'll have a grateful nation on Zans if he oh, lets yeah. Leonard go. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, and I, I this is a story that I shared with Paul once, but uh, in the course of the research for the film that I was doing, I spoke with a few FBI agents as well. Um, and one of them was a close. Well, I, I don't know if it was a close acquaintance, but he was an acquaintance of Ron Williams 
who uh, was, uh, you know, who was one of the two agents that was murdered. And um, he, uh, he was, this particular agent was one of the special agents uh, that worked Wounded Knee during the Wounded Knee siege. And then sometime after that, he was in Rapid City. He flew into Rapid City for something and needed a ride. And he, you know, reached out to his friend, Ron Williams, and, and asked, um, you know, uh, how are things going out here? And he just said, oh, you know, this, it's just terrible out here. You know, it's, it's just, it's really bad. It's only going to be a matter of time before one of us gets killed. Two weeks later, he was killed. So, um, you know, things like that, you know, the FBI knowing about what's going on, the FBI knowing, uh, you know, no, knowing of the situation, knowing of the tension. And um, we have goon squad members who have come forward to say that they actually provided funding and intelligence to their efforts on the reservation, which is true. Um, that's criminal in itself, you know, and no one is actually pressing charges against them or seeking legal redress for those activities. We just want to get a man who is wrongfully convicted and innocent freed from prison. So. Thank you for your efforts. Does anybody else have questions or comments? Kimberly. And I want to thank Kimberly for starting this movement. It's turning into a movement. She's a warrior. I'll tell you, Kimberly, yes, she every day she, she says, hey, Dan, check this out. Hey, look at this. <laughs> so. And you're yeah. not like, I'm really like, I know I'm a little obsessed because I've gotten to know Leonard and he's a very, he's a wonderful person and he's taught me so much and he's taught me how to be a better person. He's taught me about my, um, my ceremony, all of the things that my family had lost. And it's, I'm, I can't even like, I'll get all cheery. I can't, I don't want to start crying, but he's just a wonderful person. So anything I can do to help him, it's, it's become a, like it's just he's my friend like I well to i'm heading out to see him in in um may and we're yeah. trying to get paul back in to see him it's just his visitor list is full he wants to see paul again too paul by the way he definitely yeah. wants to see both paul and virgie because he hasn't seen paul and gosh when was the last time you saw him paul long time ago right yeah, yeah long time that ago. would be good for him yeah oh it would be and you know and he loved Paul's book. And, uh, you know, I mean, Paul's just a great guy. You know, I mean, it's nice for me to be able to come on here and just brag about how great a guy Paul is and how wonderful Virgie is, too. I mean, she's just Virgie. Also, I want to just say this as an historian who specializes in this subject. If it wasn't for the women, this movement yeah. would not have been what it became. Um, and if it wasn't for Virgie, Sanders' hands, like she, remember that, Paul? All day, say, uh, Virgie was putting it into the system, making sure everything was lined up correctly. I can remember Virgie saying, Dan, what do you think? Does this look good? Does this look lined up? Okay, cool. Great. So if it wasn't for Virgie, you know, that final push, Sanders' hands, you know, wouldn't have been what it what it is. And it's just as much as, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but it's just as much as her story. Yeah. Um, you know, Virgie lived through it just the same, but had it not been for the courageous Lakota women, Wounded Knee would have never happened. And in these Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization reports, a lot of these documents written by men acknowledge that had it not been for the women, the movement wouldn't be what it is, what it, what it, what it wound up becoming, you know? I mean, it was really, you know, the men had no, we didn't know what we were doing, but it was the women who stood up and said, where are our warriors? Where are you when we need you? You know, and it motivated the, the men to stand up, you know. So, um, you know, had it not been for the courageous women, you know, of, of, of the of Guala Lakota Nation, Virgie, uh, the great women on this call, you know, the movement wouldn't be um, what it is. So. Hello. Oh. Cool. So. Hi, Christopher. Oh, happening. Oh, I don't know what it is. That's awesome. Okay, so I kind of wanted to circle back on something if we could. Like, we can always say, like, the reign of terror, right? Mm. But to really, like, I, I the, when I've read in detail of that, it's, it's kind of like, it's the reason why Leonard was there. And I think it's important for us to really kind of expand on that. And since you were there, Paul, like, it was really horrible, right? <laughs> like, and like, like from the things I've read, like I posted in the chat that people had like, oh, day after day after day after day murders, 
just cold-blooded murders. And these people were afraid. And oh, yeah. I, I like to, I want to, I always try and show honor to them. I, I chat, I put their name. And so if you see me tweet that, it's, and then I'll say a cause of death. And I'm talking about the reign of terror because all of those people were forgotten. And I mean, it's, it's a wonderful tribute that Virgie and Paul have shown to Sandra. But I think about all those other people all the time. And the reason, I mean, Leonard being there was because they were afraid and they were being murdered. I don't think people understand like the extent of the reign of terror because I've read about it in detail and it's overwhelming for me. Exactly. It's it's hard to describe to people who have never been in a war or never experienced anything at that level. They can't comprehend it, what it was like. The uh, thing that uh, I would like to say about Sandra is that her murder, the way it was done, her horrendous killing brought a shock to the reservation. It's like people came together and wept over this. It's gotten so bad. And she brought the 12 Indian police from around the nation who are absolutely dedicated to protecting the children. It was Sandra who ended the violence. Her life had more meaning than I could ever be aware of at the time. She was the one who ended the violence. With, on the reservation. It just didn't stop, but it was the shocking yeah. moment. Um, so there was purpose in her life. And, but what uh, one thing that motivates us is her killer spent seven years in prison. It sure helps if you're murdering somebody to have a federal badge, believe me. He was treated totally differently. And uh, the two agents, in my mind, were not murdered. They died in an unnecessary gunfight, which should never have taken place. So did a young Lakota male, but that was just okay. In fact, the officer who shot him has bragged about it. Uh, I'd like to just piggyback on that. Um, there is a sad uh, tradition of assassinations in Indian country. Um, Buddy Lamont and Pedro Bissonette uh, well, Pedro Bissonette comes to mind first. Uh, Pedro Bissonette, um, he was, um, I think he was the president of the Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization, but he was incredibly involved in the efforts to gain civil rights for the traditionals and in instrumental uh, during the Wounded Knee Siege. Um, the way he was murdered, he was at a sort of like gathering party sort of uh, in a very remote part of Pine Ridge, and there were uh, friends that uh, witness accounts who were there with him at the party that left not that long after he was. And again, if anyone on, on the call has been is familiar with Pine Ridge, there are certain parts of it that are just very barren. They're out in the middle of nowhere. And for someone to come to for first responders to come to you, it might take a while. Um, now, these friends of Pedro's had left not that long after he left the gathering. And by the time they came up on uh, where his car was, he was already dead and being put in an ambulance. Um, his death has caused extreme controversy to this day, um, only because uh, there are conflicting reports that he had a gun. They never found the gun that he was alleged to have had. Um, but nonetheless, he was he was murdered. Um, Buddy Lamont was killed during an admitted ceasefire uh, at the Wounded Knee Siege, where both sides of the conflict had acknowledged that they, they would be a cease to all firing uh, whatsoever. And Buddy Lamont was shot square in the head uh, by a sniper. Um, so you have that. You have Byron de Sursa, who was uh, ambushed on the way to help his friend during the Wambly incident when the entire district of Wambly was firebombed by the goon squads. Um, you also have the airport incident involving Roger Finzo, who's an incredible guy. Uh, I've talked to him a few times over the phone. He was an attorney for the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Offense Committee, which represented all of the defendants that Paul mentioned that were exonerated for their participation in the Wounded Knee Siege. He had flown in with a New York attorney to the Pine Ridge Airport to gather some testimonies and get some evidence for the trials, and they were surrounded by the goon squad. And um, when they were going to leave, that's when, when they were going back to the airplane to leave, um, what happened was they found their plane riddled with bullets and they were surrounded by Dick Wilson and the goon squad who pointed out Roger Finzel and said, stomp them out. 
And literally everyone in the car, including Roger, was dragged out of the car and beaten. And Roger was about to be stabbed in the head, but his legal aide, Ida Gordon, saved him by putting her hand out, deflecting the knife and actually getting stabbed herself in the hand. So you had a lot of situations like this going on for years that went unchecked. No one, um, no one was allowed, uh, no, no, virtually no one, I should say. Some people were prosecuted, but they were usually allowed to plead down to misdemeanor offenses, even though almost every situation, excuse me, there was a felonious act being committed, um, but no one was ever charged for it. But one thing that I brought up to Leonard that Paul brought up to me, which I would like to bring up to the group now because his name was mentioned was Joe Stunts. Um, now, again, Paul, it, feel free to interject if I'm misrepresenting this, but Paul pointed something out to me and I'll never forget it. He said, you know, Dan, one day he said, you know, Joe was really a hero. Joe knew that they were probably going to kill him or that he would not make it out of there. But if he could stay there and help create some time that the others could get out. So he did that knowingly. He, did, he sacrificed himself. And he's a hero and not for nothing, but even the United States Commission on Civil Rights who attended um, a lot of the um, and observed a lot of the initial investigation into the agents that's in the week after they were murdered, attended Joe's funeral and they said he was given a hero's burial. He was given a traditional Lakota burial and they came out in droves to honor him and they still do. And also one last thing I'd like to mention is the Oglala Sioux tribal government to this day uh, they recognizes June 26 as Leonard Peltier, and they also draft a resolution acknowledging that he was asked to come to help protect the traditional uh, population who was under siege at the time. Absolutely can anybody hear me? Incredible. Can you hear me? All three of you. Mm -hmm. Really, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. I can hear you, Jojo. Go ahead and talk. You have the floor. Oh, Jojo, I'm, this is Jojo. Um, Brooke our wonderful friend. Go ahead, Jojo. Hey, Jojo. Hey, Dawn. Nice to see you. Hi, and Jojo. It's nice to see Paul and it's, is it Virgie? Did I get the mm -hmm. name right? Virgie, Great. Virginia. Virginia, nice to see you guys again. And I so enjoyed listening to you, um, Paul. And um, uh, I didn't catch the, the the brilliant young guy that just spoke. Daniel. Dan. <laughs> Daniel. Thank hi, you. I'm Jojo. Hi, Jojo. Um, Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Um, anyway, I wanted to say that um, uh, one <clears throat> other guy, I don't know if you mentioned him, I just didn't catch it. The, the guy that they, um, I guess, was, was Cherokee from North Carolina was killed. Think, uh, Clearwater. Clearwater. That was it. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, anyway, then too. you were talking about the airport incident. Mm -hmm. Do you know what, what year that happened, the airport incident? The airport incident happened in 1973. You know, what's interesting is I uh, was, you know, when I was going through the, uh, all those, I still haven't gone through all of them. I think it would be impossible. Um, the declassified documents, mm -hmm. um, they described, they were, the FBI must have been, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I always want to say harassing, but that's not the word. <laughs> uh, watching, um, what was going on because it's detailed in one of those um documents i read about the airport oh sure they knew they, they were knew. under surveillance that's what i wanted to say they oh, were under sure. surveillance because mm -hmm. one of the documents yeah described what you were saying mm -hmm. well it's it's very it's, it's very interesting because the fbi adopted the tactic of trying to litigate the american indian movement out of existence but at first mm -hmm. it didn't really work well because um they all like russell means and dennis banks won mm -hmm. their cases um, you know, a lot of the lower level, um, uh, a lot of the lower level, uh, uh, excuse me, a lot of the lower level uh, participants also won their cases. I mean, there were some convictions, but the majority of people were exonerated. Um, but what really put a what really put the damper in aim was when the agents were killed, uh, and then of course uh, when Anna May was found dead, uh, because it, it it had a lot of the uh, AIM leadership and AIM members kind of you know, wondering if someone, you know, you know, uh, if there was a um, traitor in their midst, uh, because that was another thing the FBI was very good at doing for all the movements, not just AIM. They were very good at creating tactics and, uh, uh, of, uh, and, and inputting operatives 
uh, to direct acts that would create inner conflict within a movement. They were very good at that. Uh, yeah, they did that good. quite well. Yeah, the, the COINTELPRO strategies. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, put your leaders on trial, like you said. And uh, I call it, what was that I called it one night? It's um, uh, execution of leaders by prosecution. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. That's an excellent way, but actually, that's extremely accurate. <laughs> it's extremely mm -hmm. accurate. So illegal, um, illegal um, execution by legal prosecution. Well, it's it's uh, very interesting. Um, you know, they 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 have similar tactics with Leonard because when they um, it's it's been said like Leonard um, <clears throat> Leonard has said this, um, and I remind him when he tells me, you know. Uh, they admitted that they don't know who killed the agents, nor do they know what part Leonard played in it. They, they said that twice, not once, yeah. twice. Um, uh -huh. They literally changed their conviction theory that he was right. made better, which is a completely, uh, Jojo, you may be able to speak to this as a lawyer, but um, <clears throat> that's a completely different trial. Aiding and abetting in first degree murder versus principal first degree murder, it's a completely different trial. Um, you know, and in that case, the, the, the best argument could be made for the tensions on the reservation that led to what, you know, the, I mean, the tragic deaths. And one thing, if you don't mind my saying so, um, that I want to bring up, uh, Bruce Ellison, who is the only lawyer that I know of mm -hmm. who is still alive, that uh, is still working Leonard's case, and a dynamic individual. Well, the first time I interviewed him, he said to me, he said, you know, this is, this is a very interesting point uh, that all throughout uh, the testimony in the trials and in subsequent interviews and books, etc., the Peltier side always expresses re regret that three lives were lost that day. Uh huh. Yes. The, a the FBI side never talks about Joe. It's always the two agents got killed and it's a tragedy. Never, ever do they talk about the loss of life, nor do they mention that J uh, Joe Stunts was the same age as Kohler, had two kids the same age as Kohler's two kids. Now, they were apparently on the outs from what I'm told. I don't know if this is true. But um, huh. Joe had two kids. He had two kids as well who lost their father. Um, but they don't talk about that. They only mention the agent. So it's very interesting if you look at it from that perspective, how there's more of a value of, it seems to be at least on the surface, that there's more of a value of life on the Peltier side of this conflict versus the FBI side that just likes to acknowledge the two agents that were, that were murdered. Yes, I agree. I totally agree with that. Absolutely. I didn't realize that Bruce it's, Ellison. It's was time to off. wrap this up, guys. <laughs> well, uh, I've enjoyed it. Do you want to run over a little bit or do you want to end it on time? I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> I can stay up for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we'll, we'll go to Joe. Oh, why don't you stick around if you want to? And if not, we'll catch you up with what we talked about in our newsletter. You're welcome okay, to stay uh, and, and talk. If not, like I said, then you're. Yeah, we, well, what we're going to do is send out an email with a link to this recording. Uh, the computer is doing weird things, along with room for suggestions if there's something that you like that you want more of let us know if there's something you hate let us know i seriously want to thank all of you you two changed history i mean you truly changed history and daniel you are just dynamic uh thank you if you would talk amongst the three of you i have known of sandra for decades i knew a friend of hers that left the reservation she was so traumatized and I did not know her name and her story until I read Paul's book. I would love to do a portrait of her if you want to. Oh. If you think that would be okay. I, when I've done people that have passed, they've helped me. Uh, I'm drawing Rolina right now. I'm obsessing on her eyes, but I would love to do a portrait of Sandra. Anyone who hasn't read uh, Sandra's Hands, you're in for a real treat. It's it's yeah. it's it's not just because I'm involved in it, but it is one of my favorite books on the topic because Paul had a unique and Virgie yeah. as well. They had a unique vantage point. They weren't, you know, they they weren't aim. Uh, they weren't. They were certainly not goon squad, you know. Um, 
So, but Paul hit it right on the head when he told me. He said, Dan, I was I left one war zone only to go into another one. I have not read it, but I'm excited to read it. We're just so grateful that you, you see. all came. There's a picture. Um, now, uh, Paul knows him. Um, there's a picture we met, um, Preston and I, um, Paul knows Preston as well. He was the director for the film I was doing research on. We met Jones, uh, Sandra's brother. Um, and there's a picture I have with him somewhere. I just don't know where it is, but, um, and he remembered Paul. Um, was he one of your students, Paul, Jonas? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, he was one of your students, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and also another thing about Sandra's murderer, he wound up raping an underage girl in the 1990s and they did time for that too. So he's a serial offender. Yeah. This guy, serial yeah. offender. But so. he's with, he has a dad, so it's okay. I guess so. And he's I have not, not read the book yet. It was he a, he's a law enforcement officer, this gentleman that, that, yes. that murdered her? Yes. And he was never prosecuted, I'm assuming, or something? He oh, did he was... seven years. He was allowed oh, to plead guilty goodness. to manslaughter. And uh, her death was a mercy, Jojo. He tortured her. Oh, that's horrible. Um, I hope you don't mind, um, Mr. Burke. Let me turn off my let me turn my camera. I was typing, so um, but Don shared with me the letter that you wrote regarding um to uh, actually we're not talking about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're talking about Biden. Yeah. <laughs> well, I must say, Leonard's really, 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 really happy about the uh, book club. Um, he's super happy about Paul, um, you know, being a part of it. Uh, so um, thank you all to for all your work that you're doing. Uh, it's great. Um, there's lots of, lots of cool things coming. Um, you know, more information is going to be released. Uh, so there's some exciting things in the works. Uh, you know, this has been, uh, you know, I, I must say, like, this is an energizing year for the Peltier movement. You know, there's a lot going on. There's articles being, I've heard Leonard's name. Leonard, Leonard was on CBS News. I couldn't believe it. You know, Leonard Did was you on see CBS Jennifer News. Bendry's latest article? Uh, How things about the White House. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to ask if Biden was considering clemency. The FBI called her and said, no, we're not letting him out. I, 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 I floated this to Leonard and Leonard didn't seem that he would be against it, but I, I, it would be, and Paul, I'd be interested in your thoughts if the sentence was commuted to time served. Oh, Jojo, you too. Yes. Weigh in oh, on wow. that, please. If the sentence is commuted to time served, then the FBI can say someone was punished for the deaths of the agents. Exactly. No one they could say Leonard, this. No one, no one could ever say Leonard was a rad, which we all know he isn't. And he, yeah. he's very, that's something he's very passionate about, you know. Yes. So, and they um, could say face. Yeah, they could say face. And, yeah. you know, nobody loses. I mean, Paul, Jojo, your thoughts? Uh -huh. Honestly? I'm surprised that no one has brought it up before. Wow. I assumed that it had been tried. Well, I can only comment on what I read. And I said, you know, yeah, and Leonard, he, you know, because I, I was very nervous because when I brought it up to him, it was when I was right across from him and I was visiting him. So what happens if time served? He said, well, I'll go home. And I said, oh, well, then, you know, it's probably a good sign that he's cool with that. Um, you know, it's <laughs> it's just the thing is, you know, and, and I can understand, like, the, he's been in for so long and he stood up for everything that he believed in. And, you know, I would want him to think that agreeing to this type of strategy would mean that he is conceding that he's guilty because he's not, you know. So that's where, like, that's where I go, yeah, but then it goes down as a, you know, I mean, it's still a commutation of sentence. Well, I think in the ideal world, uh, he should be given a new trial. Oh, amen. Amen. Which would clear oh, his yeah. name completely. Oh, 100%. And, uh, Paul hit it right on the head. Yeah, that would be fantastic. But at this stage in it's, his life, I thought he, we exhausted all his appeals, though, that there's no legal avenue to take there. Probably, yeah. To get us there. Well, here's the thing. 
the, all the you're right all the appeals are exhausted but what i'm told uh what i'm told is you know we have to keep going through these documents because if something ex- excuse me explosive is found we might be able to get to court it would have to be something like very explosive not like i mean something that i didn't none of us knew you know something that's buried in the documents like I, I, that's what i'm hearing that it is possible that we can get into court but we would need something irrefutable like for example um one of the lawyers ineffective counsel you know um if there's ineffective counsel and we can prove that um or you know something along those lines um something that's always that's still that i'm still on the hunt for that bothers me is leonard's trial was venue was changed without his defense knowing or acknowledging or agreeing to it which is illegal and there has been no written form anywhere that i have found and i've been to the fargo courthouse have their archives uh, copied everything there is nothing in there that uh, shows also that Leonard Peltier was supposed to be, uh, that Leonard Peltier's trial was to be moved because Ed McManus, who recently passed away and was a federal judge until his dying day, appointed by John F. Kennedy to the bench, who presided over Dino and Bob's trial, Leonard's co-defendants, has said many times that on his docket, Leonard's trial was on his docket for trials to be charged, uh, to be heard. Uh, And then it was just mysteriously moved. Nobody knows why. Um, it has been proven that Judge Benson is a race, was racist towards Indian people, and it also was proven that there was a racist juror on, on the jury. Um, so, but um, if, but the, in a perfect world, like Paul said, if this case were retried and the evidence was heard, there is no way you could get a conviction. No way. There's no way. Have you brought that up to Judge Sharp about the change of venue? So the Brady violations alone. It, I mean, does that that. Uh, that alone in today's age is it's gone. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, yes. No, I brought that. Well, I, Judge Sharp had me looking for that document. He still has me okay. looking for that document. <laughs> Maybe it's, he had to put a bug in his ear about time served. Oh, time I served. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think it's been brought up. I think it's been brought up, but I, I floated a, it. I've just got a question. Not a question. It's just a a, a, a statement, um, and I'm not saying I agree with it. Okay. But it, I'm wondering. Um, okay, I've heard of Leonard my whole life. I feel like I know Leonard. I, I knew Leonard's um, friend uh, Dennis very well, uh, but I never met uh, Leonard. And uh, anyway, I don't. I just started learning about the uh, the details the real facts of the case you know you, you you know what happened you heard there was a shootout but I started reading just a year ago you know getting the actual doc- documents out and reading a year ago okay so I don't really know all the dynamics of learning so I don't want to offend anybody by saying this but somebody typed something on tweet or tweeted it today and I just want to repeat it and see if how you guys feel about it or if it's been looked into we know that our main opposition we we know that if the fbi hadn't had those what 500 agents or mainly retired outside of clinton's white house that clinton would have probably signed um i don't know if it was a clemency thing then or um or 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 what it was they were seeking there's clemency and then there's um i can't uh, (laughs) i thought there was another word i was looking for but but any pardon Pardon. Yes, I'll pardon. Thank you. Thank you so much. I had COVID. I have brain fog. It, it drives me nuts. But anyway, um, somebody tweeted today. Did anybody else read it about, uh, you know, the, the fact that we know our main opposition is the FBI, right? Has anybody ever thought about uh, speaking to the families and seeing if they would, you know, it's happened before. And seeing if they would maybe support if we reached out to them and spoke with them, you know, that look, here's what they did to Leonard, because these are regular people. They probably don't really know as much as we know sitting here about, you know, the COINTEL strategies that, that were done to Leonard. I don't think they know everything we know. The families of the FBI? Yeah, 
Yeah. The, no, the okay. families of, of, okay. of the two of the two shot victims. Yeah. I mean, it's happened that's in other cases. Idea. That's how people get released. The families come up and say, look, we forgive them. If they did do it, we forgive them. And, you know, we don't know if they they did it. I mean, Kennedy, um, the guy was at Saram Saram. You had some of his children who uh, went to uh, bat for his pardon last time. He didn't get it. But like two or three of them uh, went went uh, to the uh, the part, not the part, the um, pro hearing, and they were supporting. Him. So anyway, I'm just throwing it out there. Has it been discussed, or do we know that they would just be raw, angry? We, you know what I mean. I briefly spoke with Mrs. Kohler uh, okay. years ago, um, and uh, she was very reserved and. Uh, She'd have to, I would, you know, I was thinking about possibly, you know, if she would be interested in talking with us for the film, which is why I reached out to her. Um, but she said she'd have to think about it. She would be in touch. And I never heard back from her. But um, uh, I don't think Ron Williams, Ron Williams was not married. Um, I did. I was in touch with someone who was a high school friend of his. Uh, her and her husband went to high school with him and stayed in touch with him. Uh, you know, he was young, obviously, when he died. Um, so I'm not sure if his family is contactable because I don't, I don't, I mean, his mother, I'm not sure if she used to attend the parole hearings, but Kohler's wife and children usually do. Um, and, uh, they have come out and said that they would support freedom for Leonard if he would just admit that he killed the, he, that he killed the agents. Um, uh-huh. and, uh, Ed Woods himself has said that he would support release for Leonard if Leonard would just admit, uh, that he killed the agent. So I'm not sure. I mean, time heals a lot of wounds. It heals most right. wounds, I think. So I think there's some merit to that. Maybe um, I still have, you know, Mrs. Kohler's number somewhere. Um, but um, I also kind of think it serves to the testament of Leonard's conviction. I mean, this is a guy who has who, who was told that like by his oppressors that he'd be free if he would just submit to something. And I mean, you know, and I, you I know what, a, for the record, I don't believe Ed Woods, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, think about think about it like that, you know, like, I mean, Leonard mm-hmm. could have gotten out if he just said, yeah, all right, I did it. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. No, I, I think but it shows, he, he it never shows did. a great so, deal. So, you know, that's, that. yeah, you have to be, you have to be careful with that, um, you know, and, and it would have to be the right person that reaches out to her. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, I wanted to, I wanted to add something to that. Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, so there's a video, I don't know if any of you have seen it or even how old it is, but it was made um, by the FBI and they do do interviews with the family members. And um, I don't know, I, I think that they, I don't know the, the way the FBI approached it. It was like, it felt to me that they were just, I don't know, you'll just have to watch it, but there is a video done that was funded by the FBI regarding the, the family and the and the 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 FBI gentleman who um, Williams and Kohler. Mm-hmm. So well, I it's mean, good, I, but you know what? I'm so glad to hear though, um, Daniel, that you spoke with her and to to, to hear that um, she was at least open to discussing things with you. And I mean I'm not saying let's do it, but it's you know it's it's a thought. No, it's something, you know, like I, I to tell you the truth, uh, Kevin Sharp is great. He's fantastic. So I, you know, I, I kind of like making, I like having a united front, you know, I don't want to do something I'm like, I wouldn't proceed with something of without course not. everyone. No, 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 I'm not proposing no, no, anything no, like just, that. I know, but I'm just saying, you know, like I wouldn't move forward with something without him, like the board knowing and everyone knowing, unless I absolutely knew, like, for example, if I got word that president Biden would meet with me, I would just go, you know what I'm saying? I would just go. Um, but, um, you know, I'm open to anything at this point, um, you know, and I think Leonard is too, but at the same time, um, you know, it's just, it's very, you know, it's very odd that, you know, like, I mean, Leonard has been incarcerated for over 40 years. Why is this still necessary? (laughs) You know, I mean, he's given his flesh. He served more than half of his life behind bars and a good portion of it in solitary confinement also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of any move we would make, it would have to be, you know, as a a whole united front. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, That's why, you know, it's important to, you know, make sure that, um, you know, that it's a united front that's going, you know, and making that statement. So, um, 
Yeah, but, uh, yeah Paul's letter. Uh, Paul's letter is great, though. Um, and c- coming from someone like Paul, like you know, it doesn't matter how much I know or what my title is in the committee. Paul lived through it, so Paul's letter, letter, excuse me, has a lot of weight to it. So, and his letter to Bill well, Clinton. Both Reynolds awesome and Ryan said that nobody has looked at the FBI's role in this whole thing. Oh yeah, Judge Haney famously said that the FBI is equally responsible, and they are. Uh, they really are. Uh, you know, they let this happen, and they knew what was happening. And instead of being the investigative body that they uh, were, they they opted to be a paramilitary body instead. Can I just add to that, please? The, um, with all the killings and drive-by shootings that were taking place at that time, to have two agents in two cars come driving rapidly into a compound searching for somebody who'd stolen a pair of used boots speaks to the level of training and preparation that these young agents were given. It's the equivalent of the Russians sending these one-year conscripts in to face the Ukrainians in the current war. They, they were The level of training and preparation by the FBI leadership and indoctrination was totally inappropriate and uh, they were primarily responsible for the death of those young young men in my mind. And I I was involved in between 19 and 21 live fire incidents on the reservation. And by the way, never fired my weapon at any any means. Stopped two of them. But uh, I've seen it and uh, Yeah. Are you guys okay if we stop recording? Yeah. Marlena wants to talk about something not on air. That's okay. But if I if I if I, if I, if uh, I just want to add Paul's prologue in Sandra's hands, it's, it's, it's a beautiful and articulate uh, way of putting what he's trying to say right now. Um, the prologue, wouldn't you say, like Paul, the prologue is, um, you know, just speaks volumes about the FBI's complacency when it comes to this type of activity. Um, it really does. You know, I mean, not to, you know, not to be too overcritical, just being factual, you know, like the prologue. Um, well, I don't want to give it away, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what uh, these, these two young men, I think they were a bit naive going in there, you know, they were well, I think they were well-intentioned, but they were, they were naive. 